Good evening, everyone. This is Ryan Hoyme, a.k.a. Massage Nerd. And this show is brought to you by our friends at Massage Magazine Insurance Plus. Massage Magazine has been exploring touch therapies for over 25 years and has used that industry knowledge to develop the best value liability insurance in the business. Welcome, everyone. This is Ryan Hoyme, a.k.a. Massage Nerd. And today we have a special, special guest, Linda Beach. Welcome, Linda. Thanks for having me. Thanks. <laughs> so um, before we get started in the topic, um, can you give me a little background and how you got involved in the field? Well, actually, I was introduced to massage back in 1980. I was in an ultralight plane crash, and my doctor prescribed all kind of medicine. And I just Someone referred me to a chiropractor. And the chiropractor referred me to a massage therapist. And back then, in the 1980, this was in Phoenix, um, you know the massage, this guy was like a hippie. And, and he did massage on his back deck with his dogs and his kids running around in the backyard. And, but what was so great about it is it was the first time that I was really pain-free. So I, I began to love massage at that time and had massage many, many, many times times over the next 10 years and I actually decided to go to massage school kind of a very last minute thing I was going to nursing school to become a midwife and I went to see my massage therapist another hippie chick whose husband was my chiropractor and I told her that there was a waiting list to get into nursing school and she said well you should go to massage school and I looked at her and I said no massage therapists don't make any money you know because <laughs> She was always barefoot, I just figured, you know. <laughs> and she said, oh, no, 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 let me talk to you about that. And so she had a little chat with me about the potential. I just never thought about it as a career for myself, and I was a single mom. And so I drove up to uh, the massage school, Space Coast, in Melbourne, Florida, and enrolled and started three days later. And the rest is history. I certainly never went to nursing school, thank goodness. <laughs> So um, it's been a great ride, and I've been doing this for almost 20 years, I guess. And, and what did you do after massage school then? Did you, have you always been a massage therapist then? or? Well, before massage school, I actually owned a children's consignment shop. I've always been an entrepreneur. So when I went to massage school, I sold my consignment shop. I went to massage school, and my first job was in a the chiropractor's office and I worked there a year and learned as much as I could about insurance billing and charting and every you know just soaked it all in but I knew that I wanted to have my own business I just that's just who I am and so a year later I opened Healing Hands of Brevard and I um, relocated my practice and all my clients came with me about a mile from the chiropractor's office and started a great adventure it was just me in the beginning um, but I was also teaching at that time at the school that I graduated from. And so, you know, when you're a teacher, everybody wants to come work with you. And so one by one, first my mom, she went to massage school after me. She became a therapist and started working with me. And then eventually I had to move into a bigger office because we had six or seven or eight of us at that point um, working together in that office. Well, and then you also um, owned a school. You own a school then too, right? That was later, so uh, after about five years of Healing Hands, um, my, my dad contacted me, he lived in South Carolina, and he said South Carolina just passed the law requiring licensure, and he said, I remember you saying that you would love to have a school someday, and I didn't really want to open it, I didn't want to compete with the school that I taught at, and I said, you know, that's not a bad opportunity to go to a state that just became a licensed state. So I literally just got out a map and, and pinpointed the schools that existed and decided to go to Columbia, South Carolina and drove around until I found a building that you know looked like it would be great for a school. And um, the rest is history. I started um, South Carolina Massage Therapy Institute in 1998. Wow, you've been in existence that long? Oh. Yeah, we started out in South Carolina Massage Therapy Institute. Two years later, I opened a second campus in Myrtle Beach, and then I, at that point, I added aesthetics. So I changed the name to South Carolina Massage and Aesthetics Institute, which is a mouthful. Which um, we've since changed the name again <laughs> to the International Spa Institute, which is easier to say. 
But, uh, so yeah, eventually I added a third campus in Bluffton, which is where I, uh, Hilton Head Island, which is where I live now. And uh, for a while I had three schools, so it was a lot of driving around. Yep. <laughs> and by the way, I love the topic for tonight. It's very, very cleverly worded and stuff, and how to get prosperity consciousness back on track. So how did you come up with that then, and why did you want to pick that topic? Well, I thought, after you asked me to be on the show, I thought long and hard about what I wanted to talk about. Um, I write for Spa Magazine. I thought, well, I could talk about you know how to get articles published and um, I teach hot stone massage, and I used to do neuromuscular therapy. I mean, I've done a lot of different things in this industry. I wouldn't call myself an expert in any particular thing. Um, I think my main strength is business. I've been a business owner pretty much my whole life. So I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll talk about business. But I didn't want to say the same thing that, you know, a lot of other people say. Um, I teach business classes, and there's all kind of great ideas out there about how to be successful in business. And there's a lot of wonderful mentors and people out there talking about it. But for me, I, I started thinking that I really needed to talk about my personal experience over the last few years and how growing my school so fast and, and becoming quite successful, not necessarily overnight, it was a lot of hard work, but then going through some changes and 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 some losses and how that made me feel I thought you know I've talked to other people recently in the industry that have either lost their business or lost their house or you know their practice isn't what it used to be and they're grappling with their feelings about that and I can relate I am too and I felt guilty for a long time I didn't want anybody to know Hey, I'm not making you know this kind of money that, that I was making five years ago. I was embarrassed. And then I thought, well, you know, it's time to talk about it because what happened to me, I'm sure has happened to other people. And part of the process was losing what I call my prosperity consciousness, something I've always been really good at, I've always been really good about thinking positively about money and making money. But I lost that in the last couple of years. I lost that, and it's uh, recently rediscovered and, and been studying and, and working on getting it back. And happy to say, things are going, things are looking up. So that's why I chose the topic. I just I felt it was time to to kind of go a little bit more, um, for lack of a better term, esoteric, a little bit more abstract, and talk about. Um, how to be prosperous in consciousness. Yep. And, and do you think the, um, the economy um, actually affected it with the whole recession and things, or do you think that happened before? Or Well, it's interesting. Um, I think it definitely had an impact. Um, you know, I saw my student enrollment um, dwindle. We didn't have federal financial aid. And, and, and then at the same time, you know, these big schools, technical colleges were coming in, and, and so my enrollment was certainly dwindling, but how I dealt with it is the important thing, and that's kind of what I want to talk about tonight, because even though the economy might take a turn, you know, and there's a lot of hype out there, there's a lot of news, there's a lot of talk about how um, we're in a depression or a recession, and, and this is why I... I I personally played the blame game for a little while, you know, and blamed it on the economy, when in fact that's not really the reason why I experienced some of the losses I experienced financially. It had more to do with my attitude and reaction to what was happening in the economy than it did to the economy itself. Because there's, there's always, always opportunity if, if you believe that and, and, and know how to go about finding it and understanding that concept. Yep. And then with, uh, um, with the whole downturn, um, things that are going on and stuff, is there anything, certain thing that tr kind of triggered it too then you think? or That triggered the downturn? Yeah. For you? Do you think you grew well, too fast? or? Yeah. I'm sorry? Do you think, think you grew too fast then? or? Um, well, I mean, you know, 
I'm one of these entrepreneurs that fly by by flies by the seat of my pants, <laughs> so to speak. Um, I don't have a degree in business. I just have a lot of spunk, and I get out there and get excited about something. I love to start things. I love to create. Um, I love to build and design and put things together. And then, and I know there's other people like me out there. And then once you do that, you don't necessarily want to run it. And that's, you know, that's great if you're a consultant and you're using somebody else's finances to start a business. But when it's your business, that's not the best um, way to run, run your business. So for me, the excitement of starting a new business and, I mean, Two, two years after I started the school, I, I opened a school in Myrtle Beach, which is three my, or three hours from where I live, only because I went there and there wasn't really a school there, and I just felt like they needed to have a good school, and I guess I was I assigned myself that job, you know, and that was great. It was a great school, and I, and I did a good job of opening that school. Um, so did I grow too fast? No, I think I did a good job in the beginning, but what happened was that there were other personal setbacks in my life. I went through a divorce, and, and things happened where it took my attention away from my business. I mean, nobody runs a business like the owner of the business. So unless you're putting your focus on it regularly and visiting and going there and, and, and being involved in your business, um, it, it just loses energy. And so that's kind of what happened with me. I just wasn't focusing on it. And after my divorce, I moved to Hilton Head Island, which was even further away from the other two schools. And I just didn't want to go anywhere. I liked it here. And, you know, I'm right by the beach. And um, so I stopped. It's kind of like stop watering a plant. I just stopped putting any energy into it. And so eventually it's going to die. You know, and, and, it's, and, and I, at the time, blamed it on all kinds of other things, the economy and a bad director and the technical colleges and on and on and on and on when one of the realizations I, I mean the things I've had to admit is that it really was 100 percent my fault you know take ownership of that take responsibility for that and understand that process yeah and so many people have a hard time accepting the the the, the, the faults themselves and stuff like that what when did that turn around that you started accepting that it was maybe more what you were doing and feeling then? That took a long time, a lot of self-analysis, because I went through a great period of time where I felt um, super guilty, because sort of um, there's this thing called a success syndrome, where we feel like we're only successful if we make a certain amount of money, or we have a certain title, or I a certain number of schools, or... You know, and for me, there, you know, I was trying to make my parents proud, and and so I worked and worked and worked and worked and grew and grew and grew and grew, and grew when in fact that wasn't necessarily what was making me joyful. I, I I loved teaching, but by the time I had three schools, I pretty much was doing. I was just running around trying to keep everybody, you know, doing their job. I was I didn't have time to teach, so I lost sight of what I. I personally loved doing. So now I'm trying to remember your question. <laughs> 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 I don't, oh gosh. All right. So when did I when did I realize what, yeah. what was the question? Yep. Yeah. When, when did I, yeah, when did you really realize it and stuff that that you accepted the downfall and stuff and um, I didn't accept it for a long time. I I, I was devastated. Um, in fact, once things started being put in motion, and like for instance, the Columbia School, which was the original school, and it was the largest school. Once you know enrollment started dwindling, and I stopped putting any energy into it, I had purchased a million dollar building. Um, that housed the school. It was absolutely beautiful, and I put a lot of time and energy into it. And part of the the downturn was the realization that I was going to lose the building. I mean, I just I couldn't afford it, and that was I didn't want anybody to know about it. I was embarrassed. I was um, I was just I was so caught up in the fact that 
this building was a symbol of my success and that without it I wouldn't be successful, that I wouldn't be perceived as being successful. That's the problem with tying into material things so much, you know, and, and saying, well, I have this fabulous house or this car and this is a symbol of my success, when in fact it really isn't. Because now that I don't have these things, like this beautiful building, you know, am I not successful? Am, am I a failure? Absolutely not. Um, it, it was hard though because I sat actually sat in the auction in the courtroom when that building was auctioned off and watched as um, the man that owned the Greek restaurant across the street purchased it for about half of what I paid for it. Wow. And I sat in my car in the parking lot and I cried for an hour, I'm just devastated because I felt like such a failure. So it took a long time for me to say, you know what, <clears throat> you're not a failure. You just, it just wasn't what you, it wasn't your passion. It wasn't what you wanted to be doing. And it really wasn't. It just took me a while to admit that. And admit that um, I actually, it was a good thing. Um, I learned a lot from the experience. That's another thing. We have to learn from our mistakes and look at what, you know, we could have done differently and what we gained from that experience. Because if I really was honest with myself then, which I now have decided, um, what did I learn from that experience? Well, shoot, I know how to um, write a killer business plan and how to go to a bank and ask for a loan and how to, you know, go through the process of borrowing a million dollars. I know how to do that. Do I ever want to do it again? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> so, so do you think this um, made you a little bit of um, gun shy from taking big risks then? No, oh my gosh. Let me tell you something. <laughs> People that are risk takers are inherently risk takers. They just are. Um, no. Uh, what, it may be more practical about the process. Um, they more um, informed. I probably, not that I wasn't at the time, I really did my homework then. I mean, the school was making a lot of money. I went through a lot of uh, work in order to be able to purchase the building, but right now, you know, I've, I've whittled my life, dialed my life back to a manageable um, one school. You know, my life is manageable. I still have things that I need to purge and get rid of in my life, but no, I'm not sorry, and, and will I take a risk tomorrow? I do all the t I do all the time. In fact, last summer I started, you know, a business, and I was trying on different things. I was trying to figure out what I really wanted to do. Do I want to actually go back in the field and do hands-on? I started a mobile spa business. Do I want to travel and do continuing education? Um, you know, or do I want to get back in and run my school full-time? Because at that time, my daughter was running the school, and I, you know, was trying different things. And what, that's one thing I love about this business so much, Ryan, is that this industry is that there's so many facets to it. I mean, you could get tired of, you know, doing one thing, and there's a hundred thousand other directions that you can take your business in. But if you really listen to your intuition, and and know that you know and find joy in what you do and I and I found joy in teaching and having a school and being able to take other people and bring them into this industry and educate them and help them find a job that I know that they will love and that will serve them for their lifetime that was my passion so I think getting back in touch with your passion it's okay then to take risks now you know again being practical Will I go out and, you know, like I said, borrow another million dollars? No, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> and the bank probably won't give me a million dollars either, so that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> so you're letting other people make decisions for you then. <laughs> yeah, but that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and Leslie, um, she asked a question in the chat, and she's from Florida. She says, um, here in Florida, LMTs just lost the ability to bill um, PIP insurance. Thoughts on how this affects the profession? Well, I can't.
came from Florida. I was licensed in Florida, and I my practice when I was in Florida was almost 100% insurance billing, and I and and I liked that. I mean, there was pros and cons, as anyone who does it, I'm sure, can relate. There was a lot of paperwork involved and and a lot of red tape. Um, moving to South Carolina, nobody here. I mean. That you just don't, you massage therapists don't bill insurance in this state. Um, a chiropractor could po probably bill insurance, and that's very, very, it's not seen often. So it's something I'm, I'm not that familiar with. So I think it's a mindset. How do I think it'll affect the industry? I don't know. I mean, I think it's kind of, I feel bad for the therapists that were, that had a practice that was dependent on that. But I think it's just a matter of knowing that if that's taken away, if you're no longer able to bill insurance, then you just need to redirect your focus and know that there will be people that want to come to your practice and utilize your skills that, that are willing to pay cash. You know, I don't buy into this whole thing that um, people can't afford to pay X number of dollars for massage. Nobody's going to pay you know, that from a side, yeah, yeah, they, they will. You just have to find your target market and redirect yourself a little bit. So if your practice is insurance billed and that's not available to you, you need to do a little marketing and, and, and decide who your target market is and go after them in a little bit different way. And, and it'll be okay. And just know it'll be okay. Yeah, so they're kind of in the same boat you are, too, and stuff. Um, I mean, so many people there, I mean, relied on insurance and stuff, and then, but they didn't get too much of a heads up, it sounds like, either, and stuff, too. So. Well, I mean, that reminds me of when the school lost Sally May. I mean, Sally May dumped a bunch of small proprietary schools, and literally, no warning, like, boom went to, you know, having the ability to have students get Sally Mae funding to none. And, and how, how did that affect me? I, I just had to, to, to really do some homework and figure out what other avenues I could use. I mean, we don't have federal financial aid and, and people, you know, I have had other school owners say, well, you know, you, you just dug your grave. Forget it. You're not accredited. No one's ever going to come and pay cash. <laughs> Oh, just one moment. <laughs> I just got tired of talking to you and hung up on you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't ever get tired of talking. So. Yeah. <laughs> and how did how did you get the last name Beach? It's such a great name. Everybody wants that. I know. I made I married into it, and I married out of it. But I kept the name because it's a totally cool name, and I live right by the beach. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and another question in the chat, um, um, Megan Holob's book, The Magic Ch Touch, How to Make $100,000 a Year as a th Therapist, talks about how massage therapists shy away from money. Do you feel like there's need to balance between joy and money? Um, I don't, I think that you can have both <laughs> in abundance. And that's interesting because one of the things I wanted to mention was um, Steve Capolini wrote a book called How to Make the Switch to Being Rich for Massage Therapists. And it's a fascinating book. And it's it's kind of in line with all of the concepts that that I was gonna that I want to talk about tonight. 
in terms of a prosperity consciousness. And it has to do with um, just knowing that you can have, uh, you can make money and and have joy and passion. There's so many massage therapists that don't feel that they are deserving of making a good living because they're healers or, you know, and, and that there's some humbleness in that. But it's not, it doesn't have to be one or the other. It can be both. Do you need to make $100,000 a year? I don't know. I mean, you might be happy with 20, but the point is, if you do what you love, the money will follow. So the key to prosperity is is finding joy in your work, finding, knowing that your work is your calling, that you're doing it because you love to do it. If you don't love what you're doing, then you need to look at that because it is holding you back from being prosperous for sure. And if you if you're working, I I had graduates call me and they say, you know, I thought it would be really great to work in this spa. And they're working me to death, and I do eight ten massages a day, and I don't like it, and I'm going to quit being a massage therapist. And it just boggles my mind because I know that they love massage. So so just redirect, you know, find a different place to work, or or take yourself off the schedule some. And I may and I know people are going to say. Oh, you make it sound so easy, but it really is that easy. It really is. It's just a matter. It's just a matter of making that decision. Yeah, and my dad always told me. He said, "If I like my job more than fifty percent of the time, it's almost like I'm not working at all." So I definitely live by that. Well, yeah. and you should. Yeah. You should love your job to where it's not like work at all. It's it should be something that gives you joy and that, and then you would do if you weren't being paid. And if you take money out of the picture, would you still be doing what you're doing? If the answer is yes, then you're you're doing your right work. And and what other tips can you give about um, getting your prosperity back? Well, one of the things I want to talk about talk about is um, and I and I shy I've always shied away from talking about my own personal spiritual beliefs. Um, in in this industry, I try to be politically correct. I don't want to offend anybody, and so people that have known me for years in this industry haven't really heard me talk about these abstract concepts. But I think we're at a place. Well, I personally am at a place where you know, if you don't agree with me, that's okay. You know, that's okay too. But I've just gone through a really difficult time, and coming out of it by remembering these concepts that I have studied for years and years and years and years. I just forgot. And that's, you know, sometimes we study something and we put it aside and we get too caught up in, in the day-to-day -day that we forget. And so it's good to be reminded. And the first thing I w want to um, mention is that abundance in the universe is everywhere. It's There's enough of it for everyone. It's all around us. It, it's like a fish in the ocean and the water is, is the abundance of the universe. And so one of the things I have a hard time with is therapists who are so worried about competition that they feel that um, if there's somebody here making this much, that's how much less that they'll make. And it's a weird concept to me because there's enough for everybody. And here's an example of... Massage Envy opened up a place in, in near my school a few years ago, and I had spa owners calling me, freaking out. Oh my gosh, Massage Envy's coming to town. They're going to take my clients. You know, they're going to they, you know, their massages are less, and and there goes you know the neighborhood, and I won't have any clients. And it baffled me because first of all, their pricing is in line with my student spa so it, it, I if, if they were going to take business from anybody it would have been the school not a spa that charges a hundred dollars and up for a massage but the point is and, and I welcomed it because first of all when there's competition it raises the awareness of the general public about massage in general it doesn't take something away from me it actually will raise the awareness and more people will know about, hear about, understand about, start getting massage. The people that go there won't necessarily go to this, you know, 
$200 a pop resort down the road. It's, it's apples and oranges. So let's just all be happy that there's enough to go around. There's enough substance. There's enough abundance in the universe for everybody. And you just have to tap into it. You just have to, it's like turning on a, a faucet or like Steve Capolini says, just making a switch. It's like the electricity is already flowing and you just literally have to turn on the switch and it's an understanding of knowing that there's enough and there's enough abundance and it's already there. So that's one thing. Another thing I wanted to mention is taking personal responsibility. That's a biggie because how many times have, I don't know about you, but I've heard students and graduates and friends and um, my children say, it's not my fault. It's because of um, my parents. I'm not successful because my parents, you know, did this to me. Or, oh, because the government, you know, it's Obama's fault. Or the economy, we talked about that, you know. Um, or the job market, I can't get a job because, I hear this all the time, I can't get a job because the market's flooded with massage therapists. There are no jobs. Um, oh, I don't have a partner in my life, and so, you know, I don't have love, and so, therefore, I'm not successful. Or, bad luck. You know, I can't do it because of bad luck. So, the, taking personal responsibility for what you've gone through, I had to take personal responsibility. I, can't, I At first, I blamed, oh, well, the lack of enrollment on the economy, or, you know, the lack of financial, federal financial aid, or Sally Mae, or whatever. And really, in reality, it was my lack of interest that caused the downturn. So I had to take personal responsibility. So it's important to take responsibility and know that you control what goes on in your mind, that it's you're not a victim of circumstance, that whatever reality you're experiencing in your life, it's what you created. And you created it through your thoughts, your actions, your deeds, and you are responsible for it. So it's important if you're having a little pity party, to get out of your pity party, to be honest with yourself about what's transpired, if you've gone through recent loss or financial downturn, be honest with yourself, understand it, and learn from it. You need to forgive yourself. If you, if you feel you're blaming yourself for what happened, forgive yourself. It's all just a process and a lesson. And begin again. Pick yourself up and begin again. Most entrepreneurs have had numerous failures. That's how you learn to be successful. And, you know, anything that you try in life has the potential of succeeding or failing. I mean, that's the balance there. Sometimes you succeed, sometimes you don't. We look at successful people and think, oh my gosh, well, you know, look how successful they are. But trust me, they've had many, many, many failures, typically, to get where they are. Um, I've started, I don't know, so many businesses that haven't been successful. You just keep plugging at it and keep trying and keep learning. Yeah, yeah. So that's a, that's a couple things. I think that, uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, you go ahead. Ask. Sorry. Okay. Um, another thing I want to talk about is, um, well, learning from your mistakes and, and looking at, you know, what, what you learned from that experience, but also the next step then is to visualize your success. And we read a lot about or hear a lot in this industry about visualization and visualization techniques and um, a real big, uh, with the book The Secret, when it came out, there was this big um, rush to make vision boards. I know Oprah had everybody in her audience make a vision board. Um, Sherry So and Mo calls them wish posters, which is what we call them at, when we do them at the school. And I just read a book recently where the author was like totally against these vision boards because he says they focus too much on material things. And what's interesting is, and I agree with that, because if you're going to do a vision board, it needs to be about concepts, about general notions. If you focus too much, you focus too specifically, it may, it may come back to bite you, basically. So, for instance, if you're needing reliable transportation 
and you do a vision board and you put a picture of a specific car on there thinking, well, if I just imagine that I'm going to have this particular Lexus and this model and this color and you focus and focus and focus on that, you aren't necessarily going to get that particular car. You just need to focus on the concept of having reliable transportation. But thinking of vision is a cool um, way to kind of bring your dreams into focus and, and help bring them more into a, a planning phase. In fact, I, I made one not long ago. I, I have it here. Can you see it? Yep. <laughs> I just peeled this off my um, bathroom mirror where it's been hanging. But funny, I did this last summer, and it's got like, and again, concepts. This area over here is all about uh, fitness and health. I want those abs right there. Um, and the kind of food that I want to eat here, and then travel, and then we've got my kind of business success over here. But at the time I did this, I had actually just getting ready to start Island Bliss Mobile Spa. So here you can see it says Island Bliss. But at this time in my life, I've decided to focus, you know, to, to not focus on that particular business. So I need to peel that off of here and kind of update it. So if you do a vision board, and then in the center of your vision board, I put um, something that relates to the source of your good. And for me, that's God. So, so that I remember where my good comes from. So that's just a neat tool. There's other tools, I mean, to visualization. But I think everybody should take time every day to meditate or do yoga or to pray or whatever it is that you do. And close your eyes and try to visualize being successful. Um, Seeing yourself as a success is very important in terms of becoming a success. Um, another thing I wanted to mention was having a grateful heart. And I'll tell you who Gloria um, Coppola, Coppola, Coppola. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> She's on the chat right now, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> I totally annihilated your name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but my sister. My sister. Anyway, she, um, when she and I did a spring retreat here at Hilton Head, she brought this video. It had a song by Karen Drucker called Gratitude, and we sang it every day. And let me tell you, I don't think you could listen to that song every day and not be grateful. But having <laughs> a grateful heart is a very important part of being prosperous. And it's not about being grateful for any particular thing. It's just about having gratitude for everything and being grateful for um, the opportunity to work and being grateful for this wonderful industry that we're in. And so practicing gratitude is a very big part of um, becoming successful or being successful and being prosperous. <sighs> <laughs> we'll take a breath here a second. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, the, another thing about being grateful is starting with what you have because I've talked to people that say, well, you know, how can I be grateful if I don't have a job or I, or I have a job I don't like? And, and you have to be grateful with where you are. You're never going to grow past that. So you have to um, bless everything in your life. Just bless it. And in fact, blessings are interesting. Blessings don't change other people, conditions, or things. However, they change your thoughts and your feelings and the consciousness that you project out there. So blessing everything is important. It reminded me of uh, little kids. I think when we're little, we just have, are born with a, a gratitude consciousness. And it reminded me of my son when he was young, we, and like Thanksgiving, everybody does that. What are you grateful for? And you go around the table, and and he was like, oh, I'm grateful for um, this chair, and I'm grateful for uh, my sleeping bag, and I'm grateful for um, the trees. And you know, it's like kids are always trying to think of, you know, like thank you God for just everything because they're grateful for everything. And then we get cynical, and life gets in the way, and Things knock us over, and, and we forget to be grateful. So it's important to have a grateful heart. That's a big part of being successful. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
And you mentioned earlier about competition. I, I think that's a huge problem with some therapists and stuff. I mean, they just think there's so much competition out there and they're just refraining from sharing techniques or even sharing massages and stuff. And I mean, um, in the town I live in, we, um, we tried to get a, um, a group together and stuff to share ideas and everything, but that only lasted one time and that was it. <laughs> That is one of my biggest, uh, you know, issues in, in talking with people. I remember when I first opened the school here in Bluffton, we had um, a program for our students called a mentoring program. They were required to find a mentor in the community and give an assignment. Like once they learned a certain technique, they had to get with their mentor and practice this technique and hopefully get feedback from a licensed massage therapist. Well, nobody in this area would work with our students because they were afraid they would steal their techniques or steal their clients. And there was such an attitude of fear. And we ended up dropping that whole program and going to an externship program, which you know accomplished the same thing and even better. But it just surprised me because I don't come from that place. I don't understand that. There is enough to go around. Um, it, one of the things I loved about the FSMTA when I was, I was president of the Brevard chapter is we would get together at our meetings regularly and share and share ideas and share um, like experiences, continuing education classes. Uh, in fact, today I was telling my students, you know, if you go do a chair massage event, there's power in numbers. Invite, you know, one of your classmates after you graduate to go with you. You know, you hand out your cards, you hand out your cards, and, and just you know, cool. support each other. We need, in this industry, to get back to supporting each other and quit trying to be competitive. There's enough to go around. That is a consciousness of lack. That is not doing anyone any good. Anyone. And I'm sorry to hear that about your meeting, but I understand that because I tried to start the same thing when I first moved to Columbia. I came here all excited, you know, I'd been involved in the FSMTA and everybody shared and, you know, where I was from and I came to Columbia and same thing. There, there was a group of people that, I call them the oldies, that were already established in the town doing massages. They didn't go to, you know, they were licensure had just passed so they were grandfathered in but as soon as the school came in they looked at us and thought oh great you know here comes the school you're going to be putting this more and more you're going to flood the market with massage therapists and and all my clients are going to wither up and die and go away and let me just tell you if you're good at what you do your clients aren't going to go to somebody else and if they do then they weren't meant to be with you anyway and somebody else will come along so just know you there's a consciousness you just have to know that there's enough work for you, there's enough clients for you, um, that if one leaves, another will come. You're just making space for somebody else that needs your, your skills. And a question in the chat. How do you take being grateful for where you are and not fall into uh, um, comp um, complacency? Hmm. Um, okay. Well, I think that it's important to... Um, try to be creative in your work. I, I mean, I've been in a space where I've fallen into complacency. I understand that feeling because, you know, we all can get bored in our job. It's the same. But this industry and doing massage has so many wonderful facets. The first thing I would tell somebody is if they're, they're, they're feeling complacent in their job is that they need to go take a continuing education class and learn a new skill. Every time. And Every time I've gone and taken a continuing education class, anyone I know, you get so excited. You've learned something new. You can't wait to come back and try it out. It gives you this renewed energy, um, something new to share. Uh, that's another thing that's kind of been weird about this industry. In the last 10 years, I've seen less and less interest in, in therapists taking actual continuing education classes. I don't know. They just want to take the very minimum South Carolina, that's only six hours a year, or um, maybe let's take an online course, which is fine for some topics, but you know, the, in order to really stay with your head in the game and to stay competitive and to stay excited about this industry, you need to take continuing education classes. Find something that interests you. Go take a class. You're going to 
meet other therapists and be able to, to grow your network. Um, expand your horizons. If you're just doing massage day in and day out, maybe do what I did and start writing for a magazine if you have that skill. Um, maybe you could start teaching. I'll tell you, there's nothing else that's more inspiring than teaching. If you've been doing massage for a while, contact your local massage schools and see if they're looking for an instructor or part-time instructor and go teach somebody. Even if you can't go teach at the school, maybe you can mentor somebody. Anytime you give back, it will inspire you. It will it will bring it will raise you up. That is so true because the thing is, I'm um, teaching. I mean, you're so humble in a way too when you're teaching and I think it's funny because uh, the students, you know, there comes a point where they think they know everything, and it's it's kind of like very, like you say, very humbling. When you graduate, it's kind of like you're, you know, you go get a license to learn. That's the very beginning of your journey, and it's important to keep learning and keep learning. And uh, and the more you learn, the more you realize there's so much more out there. And even as an instructor, I mean, I've been doing this 20 years, and there's just a world of information that that I am looking forward to um, learning. The first one will be Gloria <laughs> class or Lomi Lomi class. <laughs> That'll be my next class. I promise you, Gloria. <laughs> <laughs> and um, um, do you um, teach this information then too? Um, well, it's interesting. I haven't this just came to me literally in the last couple of days, the need to talk about this and um, just start a conversation. Like I said before, I've been very private about my spiritual beliefs. And, and interestingly enough in this industry, which there's a lot of acceptance about this type of concepts, but then there's also a lot of, surprisingly to me, a lot of um, what I call poverty consciousness and a lot of feeling of lack and so it's time to start the conversation and maybe I will put something together I mean I, I love teaching um, I love doing continuing ed and if this is a topic that people feel they need help with that they would like you know some direction in I can teach business classes you know from now to next Christmas <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, do you teach other things too then? Well, I've, I teach a class called Hot Rock Magic, and I've been teaching that since probably 1990. I think I was one of the first people to start teaching hot stone massage in the, the South. Um, I think go, coming back in full time to managing the school, I've dialed back some of my continuing education um, teaching because I've got the aesthetic school and the massage school and I'm working on you know just trying to get the school back on track so um, I actually started a company called Spa Education Vacations I started that last year and Gloria and I did the very first Spa Education Vacation we did a spring retreat here in Hilton Head which was absolutely amazing we did it we rented a house by the beach for an entire week and students came in and Everything was room included, room and board, and Gloria did Lomi Lomi, and I did Hot Stone, and we did um, How to Make Your Own Salt Scrubs, and Healing with Shells, and we took bike rides, and we went kayaking, and it was absolutely phenomenal. And so, you know, she and I discussed doing it again this spring, but I've decided to put everything but the school on the back burner, because that's another thing. When, you, when you've decided that... Um, you know, you need to make a go of something and be successful at it. It's important to put your energy, your focus entirely into it. I have this concept called plan A and only plan A. So many times you hear people say, oh, well, make sure that you have a plan B. And the thing about anything that's a plan, even if it's plan B, is that it took time and effort. So if you've got a plan A, that's your main plan, you don't want to put any time and energy into a plan B because that takes away from plan A. So it's always just plan A. Focus on plan A. Get that all set up. If it doesn't work, brush yourself off. Admit that it didn't work. Learn from your mistakes. And then go to your new plan A. Not plan B. Your new plan A. Always plan A. So always plan A? Always plan A. Okay. 
<laughs> and is there any other advice you can give to people? Well, let's see. I think that um, your work needing to be your calling, understanding that, you know, in fact, there was something here. I can't, let me find it here because I just thought this was the coolest thing. Here it is. Your work is not a place to make a living, but an opportunity to make a life. And I, I believe that because we, you need to love what you do, and that's the, and that's the key. Love it. Be grateful for it. If you don't love what you're doing, then go find something that you love doing. And again, I'm so grateful for the massage industry because there's so many different opportunities. If you don't love working in a spa, well, go try something different. Um, open your own practice. You know, if you if you uh, if you're willing to take risks, you know. But do your homework too. That's another thing. Make sure that you have people that can help you. Um, and admit where like, there are certain things that I'm not really great at. You know, massage therapists typically aren't great at doing the books. Um, you know, there are some people that are, but typically people that are good with their hands aren't necessarily good with the paperwork. So know what your strengths and weaknesses are and, and ask for assistance in the things that you need assistance with. Um, I try to do everything. I can't, you can't. You can't do everything. You know, you have to focus on what you're best at and find people that can help you with the other things. Yeah, and for myself, too, I just I knew I'd fail at bookkeeping and everything else, so that's why I hired an accountant to start off with right away. So. <laughs> that's very important. And, and I, in fact, we're interviewing people this week uh, looking for a bookkeeper because, you know, I, I keep thinking, oh, that's not difficult. I'll learn how to do QuickBooks and, you know, and... Uh, while it may not be difficult, and while I may be able to master it, and is that the best way to spend my time? And a good example, when I first was in practice, um, you know, the laundry thing. I remember, you know, ah, oh, complaining. My mom, who was also a massage therapist and worked with me, I'm like, oh, I had to take all these sheets home, and <laughs> all I did was laundry. And she's like, you have a you have sheets to take home. How awesome is that? You know, you have laundry. That means that you're successful. But there comes a point when is that the best use of my time? You know, and then I found a teenage girl that came in and picked up the laundry and took it to the laundry mat, mat with a bunch of quarters, and I paid her, you know, whatever I paid her, and and that was a that was I could then focus on doing massage. So you know, knowing where to put your your time and your energy is important as well. And what I heard too is if you can make more money in what you're doing, um, you might as well hire somebody to do those other things that you don't have time for and stuff. So. Yes, but how often do we we say, well, you know, I can't afford. In fact, in fact, but here's another thing that drives me nuts: <laughs> massage, <laughs> massage therapists who won't pay for massage. I, I talk to people all the time and say, when's the last time you had a massage? Oh, you know, six months, a year. If you are not willing to pay somebody 70 or 80 bucks for a massage, then why do you think that that people should pay you that amount? You know, it's tax deductible anyway. So, you know, go get a massage, um, walk the walk, talk the talk, get your continuing education, you know, get, get your head on straight and, and know this is an amazing industry. It, everything it, it has the ability to um, to fulfill all your financial needs if you let it. It really does. This industry, there are opportunities everywhere. I do not buy into the whole issue of you know there's not enough jobs. There's too many therapists. Um, that, that's just don't don't buy into that. That's not it's not the way it is. There's plenty of work. Plenty of people. We just need to get out and move our little feet. <laughs> yeah, and it's really depressing. Some of the stats out there are saying that maybe the average um, therapist lasts like three to five years in the field. And... Well, I think it's because people get discouraged and give up. You know, um, either that or it just wasn't it wasn't right for them, and, and it's not right for everybody. You know, I'd like to think that that it's the perfect career for everybody, but it isn't. 
you know, some people may get into it and find that it's too physical for them or um, it's just not, it's not their calling and that's okay too. So um, it's always a good experience, I think. Uh, and I've had graduates that, that don't even go into the industry, but they loved the experience. You know, it made them uh, kinder people, maybe. I. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, back in 1998, um, that's um, when I graduated massage school, and there's three of us that graduated, and two of us are still practicing, so that's pretty good odds. So. <laughs> that's not bad. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, in fact, I just went to um, the Grove Park Inn in Asheville, and I I had remembered uh, one of the gals in my very first massage class in 1998, uh, Maria Watkins. I remember she worked there, and I asked at the front desk, and it had been 10 years since I had talked to her, and they said, oh, she still works here. She's here today. And I got to see her, and I'm like, how cool is that? So we kind of connected with other the other people in that first class, and every one of them, every one of them is still working in the field. Yeah. And what can we expect from you out of the future? Well, um, I will continue to write. Uh, I love to write, and I hope to expand uh, into other magazines. Um, I don't know. I, I, you know, I'm on Facebook. Uh, I do some social networking. Uh, I'm just kind of, I'm just kind of taking it one day at a time, focusing on the school right now. I've got a lot of, a lot of seeds planted, and you know, it's just a matter of uh, just seeing which way the wind blows. I don't know. That's what I love about it. I, I don't. It's funny because I used to be all about making plans. What do I want to do next year? What about five years from now? I mean, eventually, I'd like to have a school and. Um, in the Caribbean, an international spa institute in Belize or Costa Rica. I have people come down and scuba dive and learn massage in paradise. I'll, I'll have that someday. And if you ever get know. if you ever get married again, um, keep your last name though, okay? <laughs> uh, <laughs> got Beyonce about that. Yeah. <laughs> So why why the Caribbean? You think then? Um, I, I'm a scuba diver. I'm an avid scuba diver, and I love I love the ocean. That's you know I love the beach, and um, I just think it would be a really neat place for people to come and and train and in paradise. I mean, Hilton not bad either. I tell you, um, might open a little international campus here and bring in people from. We have students from Russia coming here all the time to work in the summer, so I thought about maybe looking into that, expanding into the international market. I don't know. Um, I, you know, I want to travel some. I like to travel. That's one of the things that writing has afforded me. I don't get paid to write, but it has opened a lot of doors. You know, people on Facebook see me sitting in the <laughs> Grove Park Inn or in the Ritz Carlton and. And all of that is a result of, of writing. So maybe I'll uh, I'll write about how to write. That's always, that, that'd be a good topic. Yeah. And, and then how do people um, get a, get in touch with you then? Um, well, um, my website is uh, ISI Spa Education or International Spa Institute. Just Google that, and they can send me a message through that. Um, my email address. You want my email address? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or they can just go through the website too. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just go to International Spa Institute, and uh, and you can find me there. And and there's a list of you know we do some advanced classes and some continuing ed. And you know I really want to connect with as many people in this industry. I, I used to feel like I had had to do everything myself. Um, and one of the things this whole the last couple of years have helped me to realize is that there's a lot of a lot of friends in this industry. A lot of you know, like when I met Gloria, I loved working with her. And and I there's so many people that are willing to help you and support you and mentor you in this industry. It's you just merely need to ask. Um, I, I love having this uh, community 
uh, on social networking. That's a, that's a really nice way to connect with people. Um, I think that's how I met you, Ryan. Isn't yep. It? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So at the Lions conference. And... Yep. Yep. So I don't know. I'm just gonna keep networking and doing what I love and and training therapists and uh, just being grateful. Yep. Great words to live by. Well, thank you very much, Linda. It's been a pleasure, and my it's tons of knowledge. I mean, hopefully, people will follow some of it at least. And well, if anybody has any questions or they want to chat more about it, they can just contact me either through Facebook or through the website, yep. and uh, you know, I'll be happy to talk with them. Yep. As time permits. Yep. <laughs> and thanks everybody for tuning in. Thanks so much for having me, yeah, Ryan. Thank you.